Good evening, and welcome to the Crypto Overnighter. I'm Nicodemus, and I will be your host as we take a look at the latest cryptocurrency news and analysis. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. And remember, none of this is financial advice. And it's 10 p.m. Pacific on Thursday, October 19th, 2023. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter, where we have no sponsors, no hidden agendas, and no BS. But we do have the news, so let's talk about that. Tonight, we're diving into the murky waters of regulatory challenges and courtroom dramas that are shaking the crypto world. From a billion-dollar fraud suit against Genesis and DCG to Elon Musk and Mark Cuban's face-off with the SEC. Oh, and let's not forget the European Central Bank itching closer to a digital euro. Stick close, you don't want to miss it. New York Attorney General Letitia James filed a lawsuit against crypto heavyweights Gemini Trust Genesis Global Capital, and Digital Currency Group. The allegations? Defrauding over 230,000 investors of more than a staggering $1 billion. James stepped in because almost 30,000 of these investors are New Yorkers. So what's the crux of the lawsuit? It revolves around Gemini's EARN program, where Gemini lent funds to Genesis, a subsidiary of DCG. These funds were then lent to trading firms like Three Arrows Capital and Alameda Research. After these firms went belly up, Genesis found itself staring into a $1.1 billion abyss. Now, the lawsuit contends that Gemini was fully aware that the loans to Genesis were unsecured and even heavily concentrated with Sam Bankman frieds firm, Alameda Research. Yet, they chose to withhold this crucial piece of information from their investors. To add insult to injury, former Genesis CEO Soichiro Morrow and DCG CEO Barry Silbert are accused of deceptive practices to camouflage this monumental loss. The defendants are also alleged to have embarked on a, quote, months-long campaign of misstatements, omissions, and concealment to disguise their financial blunder. Following the collapse of Three Arrows Capital, tweets from Genesis and DCG were purportedly filled with misleading information. To top it off, DCG replaced the $1.1 billion liability with an illiquid 10-year promissory note. This maneuver was an apparent smokescreen to misrepresent the company's financial health. Adding another layer to the deceit, even after deciding to pull the plug on the EARN program, Gemini allegedly continued to rake in tens of millions more in crypto, all while their employees were quietly closing out their personal positions. And if you thought that was audacious, get this. Gemini and Genesis falsely claimed to possess the necessary governmental licenses, when in fact they should have registered under New York securities laws. The lawsuit is in line with a series of legal actions by other regulatory bodies like the SEC, aimed squarely at the crypto industry. It's a stark reminder of the regulatory murkiness that surrounds the crypto space, and it's sending shockwaves through the community. James is pushing for a complete financial industry ban in New York for Gemini, Genesis, and DCG potentially setting a precedent that could have far-reaching implications. On the flip side, Gemini took to social platform X to defend itself, challenging the decision. This lawsuit spotlights the tense relationship between regulators and the crypto world, emphasizing the need for a balanced regulatory framework. It is a stark reminder for the crypto community to stay vigilant and for the regulators to perhaps rethink their approach if innovation is to be nurtured. Now, we're going to get to Bitcoin ETFs here in just a minute, but before we do, If you're passionate about crypto, you've got to be just as passionate about staying informed. So hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and never miss an episode. Now, let's talk Bitcoin ETFs in the United States, a subject that has the crypto community on the edge of their seats. The magnifying glass is squarely on the Securities Exchange Commission. Recently, SEC Chair Gary Gensler disclosed that the agency is reviewing multiple Bitcoin ETF filings signaling a possible shift towards acceptance. But let's not hold our breaths yet. This is the SEC we're talking about. On a related note, Veronica McGregor, Grayscale's chief legal officer, is echoing industry optimism. According to her, a spot Bitcoin ETF is more of a question of when rather than if. Now, that's a bold statement coming from a significant player in the crypto investment game. But then again, the timeline remains hazy, as the SEC has not given the go-ahead. Gensler himself stated that the agency is still knee-deep in evaluating various Bitcoin ETF proposals. This phase is a pivotal one. It showcases the SEC's so-called meticulous approach to understanding this new financial model. The SEC aims to ensure a balanced ecosystem that, in their words, safeguards investors while promoting financial innovation. 
But we all know what's really at play here. It's a dance between regulatory oversight and the potential for mass adoption of digital assets. The conversation around Bitcoin ETFs is far from trivial. It's a significant indicator of the evolving dynamic between regulatory bodies and the rapidly expanding crypto market. If the SEC decides to give the green light, it would mark a watershed moment, potentially connecting the dots between traditional finance and the crypto space. And let's not forget what this means for the ideals of financial freedom and decentralization, values that are the lifeblood of the crypto community. As the SEC ponders over these Bitcoin ETF proposals, the crypto sphere is all ears for a verdict that could set the stage for a new financial epic. This ongoing narrative underlines the ever-increasing interest and strides cryptocurrencies are making in the broader financial landscape. As we wait for the SEC's decision on Bitcoin ETFs, let's remember, this approval could serve as a catalyst for mainstream crypto acceptance, amplifying the core tenets of decentralization and financial freedom. If you're on the edge of your seat about Bitcoin ETFs, hold tight. We're crossing the Atlantic next. Why? Because the European Central Bank is inching closer to a digital euro, and you'll want to know the implications. Now let's pivot our focus to Europe, where the European Central Bank is shifting gears into what they're calling a preparation phase for the digital euro. But don't be fooled, this is no green light for a central bank digital currency in the EU. Not yet. Kicking off this November, this two-year stint is slated for honing the rulebook, selecting platform vendors, and running further tests. The ECB's investigative phase may have wrapped up, but the curtain hasn't fully dropped. The go-ahead for retail CDBC in the EU is still in limbo, pending completion of EU legislation. Previously known as the realization phase, this period is more like a runway for a possible future decision on the digital euro. After this phase, the governing council of the ECB will decide whether to move on to the next stage. Essentially, it's all subject to the whims of the EU legislative process. Now, not everybody's on board with this digital Eurovision. Lawmakers are slinging mud at the ECB, with the spotlight on privacy issues and even stepping into conspiracy theories. Marcus Ferber, a member of the European Parliament's Economic Affairs Committee, suggests that the ECB might be jumping the gun. He thinks they should have waited for the EU legislative sessions to conclude, hinting that significant alterations could render the ECB's efforts pointless. But he admits that this period offers an opportunity for the ECB to refine their CDBC. Switching gears a bit, Finland, or should I say the Bank of Finland, is warming up to the digital euro, spearheading the creation of an instant payment solution in line with European norms. This is part of a larger European narrative to update payment infrastructures, making the digital euro the cornerstone. As the clock ticks, the narrative is set against a maze of regulatory complexities. Let's not forget the European Payments Council and the Bank of Finland, both hustling on a Finnish instant payment solution based on credit transfer. This collective European endeavor aims to bridge the gap between digital and traditional finance, with regulatory speed bumps, of course. To sum up, the EU is inching closer to the digital euro, with the ECB leading the charge. It's all about threading the needle between digital innovation and regulatory compliance. The next two years are shaping up to be a testing ground for the digital euro's feasibility in a complex legal landscape, and you can bet the broader European crypto community is watching closely. Now, as we navigate the EU steps towards a digital currency, it's time for a reality check. Big names like Musk and Cuban are stepping into the legal ring with the SEC. Stick around, this one's a game changer. There is a new, direct challenge to the SEC, and it isn't coming from just anyone. We're talking about Elon Musk and Mark Cuban, joined by a group of high-profile investors. They filed a joint amicus brief with the Supreme Court, essentially saying, hey, SEC, your way of doing things? Not cool. At the core of this confrontation is the SEC versus Darkasey case. George Darkasey alleges that the SEC's in-house adjudication process violates his Seventh Amendment rights. No jury, just an SEC-appointed judge. Musk? Cuban and company argue that this approach is fundamentally flawed. It's inconsistent with the SEC's purported mission of protecting investors and maintaining fair markets. And they've got data to back it up. They're pointing to a noticeable shift between 2013 and 2014 when the SEC started leaning more towards internal proceedings. Why? Well, let's just say they weren't exactly hitting home runs in the federal courts. The brief argues that this move leads to skewed outcomes often stacking the deck against the accused. And let's not ignore the elephant in the room. The SEC's in-house judges are largely insulated from meaningful oversight. 
leading to what can only be described as unfair and unjust verdicts. But that's not all. The brief also calls out the SEC for forum shopping, meaning they're prosecuting identical defendants differently. That's a one-two punch that not only damages the SEC's already shaky credibility, but also violates the Equal Protection Clause. Adding his voice to this collective discontent is pro-XRP lawyer John Deaton. He's no stranger to challenging the SEC and applauds the billionaire duo for taking a stand. Deaton pulls no punches in accusing the SEC of playing favorites, especially when it comes to past SEC officials who ease their way into Bitcoin and Ethereum-related companies after their SEC tenure. So what's the takeaway? This legal showdown is a clarion call for the SEC to reevaluate its litigation methods. It resonates with a broader sentiment for more transparent and equitable regulatory frameworks. In a nutshell, it's a legal skirmish that could set a precedent, realigning the SEC with the constitutional ethos that should, in theory, govern their practices. Elon Musk and Mark Cuban challenging the SEC is an echo across the crypto legal landscape. But shifting gears, let's move on to Coinbase. They're sailing to Ireland seeking regulatory refuge. You'll want to hear this. In the face of tightening regulatory shackles in the United States, Coinbase has made a strategic pivot. Their new European headquarters? None other than Ireland. This move is no knee-jerk reaction. It aligns with the upcoming European Union's market and crypto assets regulation, known as MICA, set to take effect in late 2024. So why Ireland? It's a two-pronged rationale. First, Coinbase already has boots on the ground in Dublin, with a history stretching over five years and a team north of 100 professionals. Second, Ireland's political climate is notably fintech friendly, not to mention its reputable regulatory authority. Coinbase is already in the process of securing a license from the Central Bank of Ireland. This is a linchpin in ensuring smooth service to its EU customer base under the passporting rights granted by MICA. They're not newbies to the regulatory game. The exchange already holds an e-money license and a virtual asset service provider registration in Ireland, along with a crypto license in Germany and other EU nations. This proactive move underscores Coinbase's keen foresight and commitment to the regulatory compliance, especially in a region with 450 million individuals across 27 countries. It's a strong play in building trust and broadening its European user base. But there's more to this than just a single company. What we're witnessing here is a narrative in the making. The U.S., with its heavy-handed regulatory approach, contrasts sharply with the EU's more accommodating stance. The MICA framework, officially greenlit in May 2023, is a landmark in crypto law. It aims to create a standardized regulatory environment across the EU, a far cry from the piecemeal approach we're seeing in the U.S. Coinbase's Ireland move is a harbinger of things to come. It underscores the critical role that regulatory landscapes play in shaping the destiny of crypto enterprises, and by extension, the global digital asset market. Coinbase's Irish haven is one side of the crypto coin. On the flip side, crypto's under fire for alleged terrorism ties. If you found value in our segment so far, do me a favor. Like this episode and share it with your friends. The fight for balanced information is on. Next up, we delve into a subject that's got Capitol Hill buzzing. Cryptocurrency and its alleged role in financing terrorism. Leading the charge is Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, backed by a sea of lawmakers, 28 senators and 76 House reps to be precise. Though predominantly Democrats, this bipartisan group is sounding the alarm bells over the illicit use of digital assets. These lawmakers are pointing fingers at terror groups Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, claiming they've raked in over $130 million in crypto donations. The backdrop? The deadly Hamas attack on Israeli civilians which led these politicians to label Hamas as one of the most sophisticated players in crypto terror finance. Their letter is a clarion call for decisive action, especially as legislative wheels are turning in Congress to tackle risks associated with crypto money laundering and illicit financing. However, not everybody's buying this narrative. Interchainalysis, a crypto analytics firm challenging these ominous claims. According to them, while terror financing via crypto exists, it's just a drop in the ocean compared to the overall illicit crypto transactions. Chainalysis goes further, stating that the traditional fiat methods still reign supreme as the primary financing channels for terror outfits. In an attempt to quantify the crypto funds allegedly funneled through Hamas, numbers like $82 million have been floated around. Chainalysis, however, calls this out as misleading. Their estimate? 
a mere $450,000 from a terror-affiliated wallet, debunking the inflated figures that have been making headlines. This unfolding debate brings into focus the broader implications of crypto's decentralized and anonymous nature. It's stirring up a political tempest, putting the spotlight on the administration's stance on crypto's potential misuse. On the other end, the crypto community and firms like Chainalysis are pushing back, advocating for a more nuanced perspective that separates fact from fiction. So what's the takeaway? As the discourse heats up, the need for balanced, evidence-based dialogues is becoming glaringly obvious. It's a call that's resonating not just within the crypto community, but also through the corridors of power. So what happened? The New York Attorney General filed a billion-dollar fraud suit against Genesis, DCG, and Gemini Trust. The allegations are heavy, and the potential repercussions are even heavier. The SEC is actively reviewing multiple Bitcoin ETF filings. It's a delicate dance between regulatory scrutiny and potential mainstream adoption of digital assets. The European Central Bank is moving into the preparation phase for the digital euro. Despite the buzz, it's not a done deal. Lawmakers and central banks are still jostling over the final form that it should take. Elon Musk and Mark Cuban are taking the SEC to task over their internal adjudication process. It's a legal challenge that could set a precedent for how the SEC conducts its affairs. Coinbase is packing its bags and heading to Ireland, aiming for a friendlier regulatory environment as the EU prepares its landmark MICA regulation. Finally, lawmakers are raising the alarm over cryptocurrencies being used for terrorism financing. The data, however, paints a more nuanced picture. Tonight's overarching theme is a battle for control and legitimacy in the cryptosphere. We're witnessing a collision between the fast-paced world of digital assets and the traditional mechanisms of regulation and oversight. From the New York Attorney General's massive lawsuit against Genesis, DCG, and Gemini, to the SEC's wavering stance on Bitcoin ETFs, it's evident that regulatory agencies are trying to catch up with a market that refuses to slow down. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, the European Central Bank is cautiously stepping into the realm of central bank digital currencies, facing its own set of challenges and criticisms. Corporate giants like Coinbase are strategically maneuvering through this regulatory maze, searching for greener pastures in places like Ireland. But it's not just about institutions. High-profile investors like Elon Musk and Mark Cuban are challenging the status quo, questioning the fairness and constitutionality of current regulatory practices. Last but not least, the ongoing debate about cryptocurrencies and their alleged role in terrorism financing serves as a wake-up call for the community. While the concerns are valid, they should be addressed with a balanced perspective, separating fact from sensationalism. In conclusion, the crypto world is at a critical juncture, influenced by an array of regulatory actions and decisions that could either foster innovation or stifle it. It's a dynamic landscape, and as always, we'll be here to guide you through it. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. If you enjoyed tonight's show, then please like, follow, subscribe, leave a rating, or maybe a review. And in the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow night.